8, and the vision Amos sees is of the basket of ripe summer fruit. Have you ever heard someone use the phrase, and it's uh, a preacher's phrase, I suppose, they are ripe for judgment. And that's what Amos has in mind, and what God reveals to Amos when he shows him that the summer fruits are ripe. The time for harvest had come, but this is not a harvest of salvation. This is the harvest of judgment. Israel, remember the northern kingdom in the time of Amos, had not heeded the warnings of the prophets, and so they were ripe for judgment. As a nation, God announces, Israel had come to its end. Remember, Israel being the northern kingdom, which came to its end uh, quite a considerable amount of time before the southern kingdom of Judah. It doesn't mean, uh, when he says in verse 2, the end has come upon my people Israel, it doesn't mean the, that every individual Jew would be wiped out, that there would be no more Jews. Clearly not, there are still Jews today. But what it means is the nation would cease to be, and it did. And in that complicated history of that land, which we know as Israel and or Palestine, um, the northern kingdom of Israel ceased to be a nation after the invasion of Assyria, and it did not exist again, uh, really, until 1948 because uh, it was the southern kingdom, by and large, that returned to the land after, you, you remember, the later deportation of the southern kingdom by the Babylonians. It was mainly the Judeans who returned to Jerusalem and rebuilt the temple and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, and the recovery began there. So as a nation, that northern kingdom, well, there never has been a northern kingdom since. So the end has come. Quite literally, God was drawing a line and saying, this is it. We're not having any more of it. He could no longer overlook the sin of his people. And he was not going to give them any further opportunities to repent. Do you know, a farmer, when he sees his crops are ripe, he has to take action straight away. Or uh, the harvest is past. And we find... The Bible describing a similar judgment in Revelation 14, verses 14 to 19. Then they looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, and in his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sucker. And another an angel came out of the temple, crying in a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sucker and reap for the time has come, for you to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he sat on the cloud, thrust in his sucker on the earth, and the earth was, was reaped. And another an angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sucker. And another an angel came out from the altar, what power of a fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him, who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So in fact, the harvest pictured in Revelation 14 uh, is a dual harvest. Jesus spoke about such a dual harvest and so did John the Baptist in speaking of the ministry of Jesus. John said that the Lord Jesus Christ would gather his own, that's believers, safely into his barn, that is into his presence in heaven. And you might see that uh, first vision there in the book of Revelation, Jesus gathering his own to himself as he reaped a harvest of salvation. But then after the harvest of salvation came the harvest of judgment. He shall burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And as that uh, group of people, the ungodly, in that revelation vision, are reaped, they are cast into the winepress of God, signifying his judgment and punishment. In the vision Amos sees about Israel, there is no further chance of salvation, he just goes straight to the reaping for judgment. And in verse 3, 
we see that God would put an end to the mirth of his disobedient people. They carousd in the idol temples, but their songs would be changed to cries and wails as the Assyrian army attacked and slaughtered them, and the silence of death would follow. It's something to think of, that a nation can be going along its normal business, even though that business is very wrong and sinful and against God. Uh, they're singing, they're drinking, they're having a good time, and suddenly, I say suddenly, God had been warning them about it for decades, centuries even, but suddenly, from their point of view, it was almost without warning. Why? Well, because they hadn't heeded the warnings. Jesus warned that at the, the end of time, it would be like the days of Noah. Although Noah had warned the people, it was uh, as if he hadn't, as they paid no heed to it. And suddenly the flood came and destroyed them all. We should beware uh, of the warnings God gives us of his pending judgments. In fact, the warning continues in verse 4. Amos was still speaking God's message to the people. So, we could count this as one last opportunity to repent. How long suffering is God and not immediately taking action when it is uh, deserved? Amos is addressing his message to the rich oppressors, not for the first time in this prophecy. Those who forced the poor to sell their land at low cost. Some were forced to sell themselves into slavery. Others died from poverty and want. And in this way, as he puts it here, they trampled on the needy. Instead of using their power and their wealth to support and help their fellow Israelites, uh, they acted in a selfish way to put them down. I mentioned at the start of our studies in Amos that you could describe Amos's teaching to the northern kingdom as a kind of social action or socialism in action but not at all the socialism of politics not at all the socialism of this world but the socialism of God where God requires every man every woman to be responsible and caring towards his neighbor and particularly if they're your own people yeah and uh, it's a message we find in the prophets again and again, it's a million miles away from the atheist, socialist, communism that we see in this world. And yet it uh, does a much better job, uh, if people heed it, of caring for the poor and vulnerable than that worldly system ever could. In verse 5, the observance of religious days and festivals continued in the northern kingdom. But the people were enduring them with some reluctance. The people's hearts were so far from God that instead of honouring and worshipping him on holy days and finding joy in the worship of God, they were impatient for holy days to be over. God was getting in the way of the people. He was getting in the way of what they considered to be more important matters. Have you ever felt like that? Oh no, I've got to go to church. Ah, I've got something better to do. Oh no, I... I need to pray this morning, uh, but I'd much rather be doing something else. It's an attitude that Christians today can fall into. What is our attitude to the worship of God, to our meeting Him in the holy place? Is the time we give to the service of God given willingly or grudgingly? Are we impatient to get away so we can spend our time on our own pleasures and interests. How many would rather be out shopping than worshipping in the presence of God? How many would rather be gossiping than serving Christ? Perhaps our modern attitudes are not altogether so different to the attitudes of people in Amos's time. And it is, of course, uh, an attitude of hypocrisy. What these people preferred to be doing was making money but doing so in a way that was not uh, honest. Selling their grain at dishonest prices. Cheating customers. Uh, you know, when you used to buy grain or other produce, you'd weigh it out. That's how they used to do it. Mm -hmm. They would weigh the produce, they would weigh the silver that you had, and there'd be an exchange. But according to Amos, people were being swindled. 
uh, the weights had been changed. So uh, you thought you were buying half a pound of grain, but actually you were getting uh, a little bit less. And then the other weights, so the one that weighed your money, well, that had been made a bit lighter so that you'd pay more money. And the prices were going up and you were getting less for your money every day because these people were greedy. These cheats would give you three quarters of a kilogram and tell you it was a kilogram using dishonest weights and scales, making the ephah small. Uh, the ephah was a unit of measurement uh, that they used to use, just as we today use the kilogram. Silver coins, when they were weighed, the weight of a shekel was put on one side and the weight of the coin was put on the other side of the balance. But by increasing the shekel weight, you were charged, overcharged, perhaps even double charged. Verse 6. They were intent on increasing their fortune at the expense of others. I've said before, and uh, we were chatting at the start of this meeting actually, if you've got a job, if you're working, if you're making your money, that's good, that's biblical, that's what the Bible says to do. And then when you have your money you're to use it for yourself and your family, that's good, that's right, that's what God intends to do. But also to support and give to the work of God is something God intends. The point is not here that they shouldn't have been out making money and earning a living. The focus is on how dishonest this uh, making money was. Not only did they make slaves of their brother Israelites, those who weren't slaves, uh, who were servants, who were paid a very low wage for their services. So here we find in uh, God's judgment against the people, He's telling the employers they're not paying their staff enough for the work they do. After they had paid them, they recouped most of their money by selling their own workers low quality grain. Selling the sweepings of the wheat. Yeah? They charged them for the chaff when they measured out the wheat. It was barely fit to eat. Buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals can speak of slavery. Uh, but not necessarily literal slavery, that did happen. But it also shows what a low value they placed on their brothers and sisters in Israel. With an oath in verse 7, God promises never to forget the crime of oppressing the poor. And it's an oath taken in his own name, by the pride of Jacob, or the excellency of Jacob, which is Jacob's king, and that's God. God is swearing by himself. He will never forget uh, or excuse this treatment of the poor. And any country needs to be careful that if God has blessed that nation with wealth, that that wealth is shared. Again, this is not some kind of atheist, Eastern socialism made up by Lenin or Marx. This is God speaking to his people. You better mind you obey. God because they did not obey, was going to send the most terrible judgment. Using the symbols of earthquake and flood, God shows how the nation would be punished. He describes the river Nile in flood. And when that river would burst its banks, there would be devastation all around. In fact, if you had any sense, you wouldn't build a house near the river Nile. In a similar way, the invading armies of Assyria would come like the Nile in flood, sweeping away the land and its people, and the survivors, the few that there were, would mourn bitterly. In verse 9. It's by no means certain that the prophet literally means that the day of the invasion would coincide with the darkening of the sun. However, Mr. Bealey does point out that there was a solar eclipse on the 15th of June, 763 BC, quite close to the time of Amos's ministry. However, we should take perhaps the uh, darkening of the, the light uh, to signify the awful grief that the disaster of invasion caused rather than a sign in the heavens coinciding with it. However, that word of Amos, symbolic it might have been at the time, it's also prophetic concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he says, on that day I will make the sun go down at noon, our minds are taken to the most important day of history, when Christ took away the sin of the world as he hung on the cross. 
And as the Son of God suffered God's wrath and punishment for our sin in our place, the whole earth turned dark at midday. You'll read that in Luke 23. Let's read it. Luke 23, 44 to 45. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. So at midday, the sun stopped shining, to use the Apostle John's words. And remember, this was Passover, full moon, so it was not possibly an eclipse. In Amos, God speaks of darkness darkening the sun to denote his terrible judgment. God literally put the sun out on the day when his judgment fell on his only begotten son, the most important day of history. A supernatural darkness. God saw fit to draw a curtain over his son's suffering, which was perhaps too sacred or maybe too dreadful for us to look upon. One thing we learn from the judgments of God in the Old Testament is there is as we look at the New Testament, there is no way of averting God's judgment. There is no way of escaping God's wrath except through his only begotten Son. That's something that the Old Testament teaches us. They had sinned, they had not repented, there was no way back. If only there was someone to intercede for them. Thank God that's the good news the New Testament brings. Because of Jesus, there is a way back to God. In verse 10, Since Israel indulged in pagan revelry, God would turn their joy into mourning and their singing into misery. Think of that. If your joy and your singing is in the Lord, God's never going to silence it. It'll carry on eternally. But when your joy and your singing is pagan, uh, that's another matter. Do you know, it will all end. I, I, I was thinking today, I honestly forget in what context. But I was thinking of, um, it might have come up on the news, but there was some lady singing songs to herself, trying to cheer herself up. That's a rather hollow cheer, isn't it? I, I, I've never been able to cheer myself up. But if God cheers your soul, if he cheers you up, then you, you've really got something solid and tangible to be cheered. But all those songs of mirth will eventually end forever. Just as they did in the northern kingdom of Israel. Fine clothes would give way to sackcloth. Heads would be shaved. Perhaps signs of grief and mourning, but also signs of slavery. The bitterness of those days would be like mourning for the death of an only son, says Amos. And indeed, many only sons would be lost in that war. Verse 11, since the people had hardened their hearts and refused to listen to God's word, look what happens now. God would prevent them from hearing his word at all. He had nothing more to say to them. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ stood in front of King Herod after he had executed John the Baptist and now Jesus is on trial for his life? He didn't answer him a word. And this is God, the Almighty, incarnate, standing in front of someone who pretends to be judging him. But he's actually judging Herod. I haven't got a word to say to you, is basically what Christ told him. God is saying to this wicked people who would not listen to his word, Okay then, you're never going to hear it again. I will send a famine of the word of God. You don't appreciate it, you will learn its value by losing it. Ray Bealey says this, This is the most disastrous thing which can befall a nation. And he goes on, I'll quote the, the whole paragraph. Without the word of God, Israel had no divine law to regulate its life, no calling to repentance and spiritual and moral purity, no promises to encourage and sustain. Although men did not realise it, this is tragedy indeed, for when God's word is withdrawn... Men both lose hope and cast off restraint. Throughout our world today, God's word is being widely ignored, especially by those in power and authority. 
In our country and across Europe, laws are being made contrary to the laws of God. A majority of people in our land suppose there can be no moral absolutes. Do you know what's become a moral abs absolute in our nation? Whatever the majority seem to think. If the majority think it's okay, if there's a referendum and we vote for something, it must be right. They reject the authority of the Bible as the inspired, infallible word of God, and they replace its teaching with their own kind of morality. I got in trouble once for reminding an assembly of comprehensive school children, the teachers didn't like it, because you know some people have got a very funny view of history. I just reminded them that Hitler was democratically elected in a free and fair election. They didn't like that. But that's the truth of history. The majority don't always make the right decision. What the majority says is right could be completely evil, as it was then. We must beware not to ignore the teachings of the Bible. In fact, today it's gone so far, people are describing the teachings of God's word as immoral. They're describing it as hateful. The word Nazi has been applied to Christians and the scripture. There are people today who want to ban this precious book from our Christ one time Christian country. There are people today who want to stop us preaching from this book. Well, I don't suppose it's ever been any different. Then Amos's time. Why were the prophets killed, stoned again and again? It was to shut them up. They brought God's word. People didn't want to hear. They wanted to silence those who brought it. I read, um, and again I forget where I read this. It was in a paper recently to do with education. There are those, you see, who... When the Bible warns against sex before marriage for our young people, and so the Christian teaching for young people would be abstinence before marriage, I have read in a paper that this is damaging to the normal sexual health and development of our young people. I go on to quote, they must learn how to express their sexuality in a way that, listen to this, feels right to them. That's their own moral absolute. Whatever they say, whatever they feel, is okay. They reject the all-wise voice of the one who created man and woman in the beginning. And that can never go right. Train up a child in the way he should go, says the Bible. Um, and I'm not in favour of walloping children. I'm not against uh, what, what with the little toddlers we call smacky bum bums. I, I, I'm not against that. Um, I never want to see a smack that hurt the child more than a little sting. Because, you know, it's hard to communicate with someone who cannot speak or understand your speech, except with a little... That's all I'm talking about. But, you know, that is now illegal in, yeah. in our country. That is against the law in Wales. And, in fact, the enforcement of the law begins next, early next year. But it's already a law that is passed. Parents will go to jail and have their parents took off them for something as simple as smacky bum bums. Mm -hmm. They label it child abuse. You think the NSPCC would have something more to do with its time and its money? Like helping children who really are being abused and who are being found nearly dead mm -hmm. on the street, a hundred yards from my home. It, was only, it wasn't the social services that saved that little boy's life. It was a policeman who wondered why he couldn't get an answer, kicked the door in and saved the boy's life. That's what we should be focusing on, not young parents who uh, need our support and help in bringing up children. What will be the result when God's word is rejected? One day his pleading voice will fall silent. Men who refuse to hear will find no more opportunity to repent. Now, do you remember how, um, it's the writer to the Hebrews, he talks about Esau. Okay? And when Esau rejected his birthright, he sold it to his brother. He despised it, he thought nothing of it. 
It says he found no way of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He begged his father, Isaac, to bless him. Bless me too, my father. Bless there was no blessing. If we ignore the word of God, we can repent as much as we like afterwards of the consequences of ignoring the word of God, but no such repentance is available. God gives us opportunity to hear and receive his word and act upon it, and that is biblical repentance. We may not have tomorrow, which is why the Bible tells us, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. We must pay heed to the word of God. It's what Israel failed to do, and their nation was no more. Not only does this teaching apply to individuals in the Bible, as we notice with Israel, it applies to whole nations. God will withdraw his blessing and protection from any nation which ignores his word. Perhaps the only reason that our country has not yet been overwhelmed with disaster is that there are a few faithful people among its citizens who do not cease to mourn the ungodliness in our land and appeal to God in prayer on its behalf. Do you remember Abraham standing before God, between God and Sodom, pleading for Sodom? God said, if I find just, just five there that are righteous, I will spare the whole city for their sake. He didn't find five, he found one. So he saved him and his family and destroyed the city of Sodom. Even in the professing church, I believe there is at this time in this country a small number of those who are faithful to God and his word. I'm increasingly convinced of that. As God's people living in a wicked and corrupt generation, we must continue to shine as lights in the world. We need to persevere in our all-important work of making the sinner's saviour known to all men, preaching the gospel to every creature. And don't get sidetracked by the latest issue on the telly, the latest thing in the newspapers, Instead, preach the gospel that a sinner's saviour has given his life. That's what's needed in our country today. It's not a change of government. It's a change of heart. It can only be achieved as men and women repent, believe in the gospel, and are born again of God's spirit. It saved England in the 18th century at the time of revolution in France. Why was there no revolution in England? Well, there had been a great revival. Rich and poor had turned to Christ in their multitudes. You wouldn't have the poor servants chopping off the heads of their rich masters in the afternoon when they'd been kneeling humbly, praying and taking communion together in the morning. This mighty salvation of God has a national impact. And throughout history, it has swayed the direction and the fortunes of nations, particularly the nations in these small British Isles. To Israel, in verse 12, Amos says that men would realise too late what they had lost. Look at them, wandering from sea to sea, from north to east, running to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. All he has left to say to them now is said, it's embodied, if you like, in his judgment. Mr. Bealey says, God is sovereign as to when and to whom he offers his word. We cannot afford to neglect it. Have you ever heard the preacher say when they're preaching the gospel to someone in the congregation? You know, don't put it off to tomorrow. This could be your last opportunity to accept Christ as Saviour. And sometimes it is. I always remember Brother Bonke preaching in a certain place. And uh, he noticed one young girl in the audience that was under conviction but wasn't responding and he went out to the door to try and catch her on the way out and have a conversation with her but she rejected Christ and she said mainly because her boyfriend wouldn't like it and she went out and uh, he heard in the next night of the crusade that young lady had never made it home she'd been run over by a bus and had lost her life how tragic to neglect the word of God. We reject it. We may not always get another chance. Israel have been told, you are not getting another chance. 
In verse 13, the judgment is pictured for us as beautiful young women and strong young men, faint from thirst. The literal result of the siege of Samaria, so well known from history. In verse 14, we come back to the root of the problem, if you like, in Israel. Idolatry. They would never rise again, for they had spurned the true and living God, worshipping those golden calves in Dan and Beersheba was something they could never get away from. How many men and women are worshipping other gods without realising it today? Do you know, uh, gambling is still a problem. Greed is a problem. Filth and lust, sometimes shown by dirty jokes. As Christians, we need to have that caution about entering into unclean jesting. It's so easy for some folk to slip into, but we must be on our guard because it is a plague in our country. Irreverence towards people, blasphemy towards God. It's all over our television screens demonstrating how far we live from God as a nation. But don't let it creep into your heart. Let's remember the exhortation of Scripture as we come to, to the end of tonight's study. Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, so that you do not share in her plagues. Don't let judgment come on us, Lord. Let us be the ones who heed and obey your word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank God for his word tonight.